Excellent. Okay, well, we are going to kick things off. We're here today to share a little bit about how we as a company think about knowledge management and um, also, of course, how we use our own tools to accomplish the things that we want to do. So um, I will just briefly introduce myself and say, hi, I'm Maddie um, or Madison either is A-OK. -okay. Uh, I've been with Zendesk for about five and a half years and I've always been kind of a lover of knowledge and user of documentation. So it was kind of natural to fall into this team and this role. Um, and I'll give Melissa a chance to introduce herself first too, before we kick it over to Melissa. Hi everybody, I'm Melissa Birch and I am so lucky to be able to be the director of self-service here at Zendesk. Um, what that really means is I'm, I'm really a customer of Zendesk, but I have a lucky privilege of working for Zendesk at the same time. So it, it puts me into this really lucky position. And what I'm delighted to do today is take you through some of the amazing work that my team does. And in, um, in an effort to make you and all of our customers more successful at using Zendesk. So Maddie, if you go to the next slide, I'll just kick us off. Um, one of the things I wanna share with you is just give you a, ver a version of our journey of what we've, of where we've been with regard to knowledge management here at Zendesk. So on the next slide, you're going to see a lot of words. Don't worry if you can't catch them all while I talk right now, because the slides will be available for you for review later. But one thing I want to just call out on this particular view is that this is our Zendesk version of, of our journey. And everyone's journey will look slightly different. Your timelines will be different. But there's a few things I'll call out here. One is that our product documentation team, which is a centralized group, uh, they publish content that I'm sure many of you have used. Uh, into our help center. They have been doing that since about 2017 and beyond, um, really when Zendesk began. Um, so we have a, a really great privilege of having a very strong baseline of knowledge management that's been happening for many, many years here. It doesn't, and it's just been a wonderful opportunity for us to then dive off and add on uh, more elements to our knowledge management program as we have progressed throughout the year. So I'm just going to highlight a few. Maddie mentioned knowledge-centered service. We did begin that journey in 2016. And uh, as Maddie mentioned, there will be a link somewhere here, which will take you to the webinar that we talked in great detail about how we actually utilize knowledge-centered service here inside Zendesk. Um, we will hint at it today, but for more details, feel free to review that. And I'm gonna call out a couple other things. We formally dedicated a community team in 2017. We also formally engaged a content team in 2018. And there's just a great deal of interesting things that we have on our, on our um, coming up on our plate. So one of them is the introduction of a chat bot. So kind of new frontiers coming in 2021 uh, summer, you'll start to see and have the capabilities of interacting with a chatbot as you um, to help us offer you more self-service opportunities that way. And if we move to the next slide, that we get asked often, what does our org structure look like around self-service? And so I'm gonna, there's two slides, two components to this. The first is the version that um, is most closest to uh, me and my organization. So we have two essential arms within the self-service team uh, in, my, in my world. And the first one is uh, what we call a proactive and automated support team that's led by Christina Libs. And then you're meeting Maddie Davis. She leads knowledge management program here. Uh, you'll seeing a dotted line off to Nicole Saunders and the community team. That's just to indicate that we also have a uh, really robust community program here at Zendesk as well, and that we think of that in the umbrella of self-service as well. And you'll notice the um, faces that align underneath each one, and that's just to give you a sense for what, how many people are aligned into each of those functions. So you kind of have a sense of how we're, how we're resourced. And then the next slide is 
zooming out a bit more actually to indicate that self-service from a Zendesk perspective isn't possible without the support of lots of different teams inside of our business. And I'll just call out a few that are really critical for us. The first is a data and analytics team. So as every self-service person knows, it's we have to have some access to data and analytics to be able to report to our leaders on what, um, what we're doing and how it's affecting the business. So we turn to um, a data and analytics team to help us with that. They augment what we can do independently, which Maddie will talk about more of the things that we can actually do ourselves, but we, we need them to do some um, additional analytics for us. And then I'm gonna call out um, that we have great working relationships with our product development team, as well as product doc team, which sits inside the product dev organization. And then finally, couldn't do it without our support agents who help us um, in our maintenance efforts around our knowledge base. So Maddie, I think it's time. I'm going to turn it to you. This is what everybody really wants to know is how do we do all of this? So Maddie's going to take you through the details. Excellent. Thank you. I thought I would just highlight first some of the most important tools in our toolbox that we use to accomplish what we do. As I take you through um, our overall strategy, we'll also talk about how each of these tools contributes or how we leverage them to get things done. So to kick things off, the first guiding principle that we follow is a belief that uh, the tickets that your customers submit represent customer effort. And that might sound kind of simple on paper, but we know that most knowledge teams and I think many operational teams altogether don't always feel like they have great visibility into the questions that customers are asking about. And I think tickets um, and digging into those tickets is the best way to gain that knowledge. So the first thing we do is use Explore to try and understand where the biggest sort of like buckets or clusters of tickets are coming in. Uh, if you're not already, we definitely recommend using some kind of about field or like other ticket field to indicate a category or like contact reason, just something that's useful for you to understand trends and volume over time. Um, and we use Explore to see which tickets are being submitted most frequently about each product and then features within each product too. So in addition, um, we might look at how many of those tickets have a high number of for example, like one touch tickets, uh, maybe CSAT trends, handle time trends for each topic. You know, one touch tickets can be a great indicator that you've got um, answers that could be turned into an article or maybe articles that aren't being found for whatever reason and people are needing to reach out to get information about that topic. Um, and I think lower CSAT or like a higher handle time can help spot areas where you might have opportunities to decrease frustration or eliminate some effort along the way. So that's how we listen to try and understand what our audience needs. Um, you can also make that work even easier on yourself by leveraging a feature called Content Cues. Content Cues is one of our favorite tools within Zendesk. It's a feature of Guide Enterprise, and if you're not familiar with it, it uses machine learning to sort of bubble up clusters of support ticket topics based on the tickets you've received over the last 60 days. Um, we really love content cues because in addition to surfacing those sort of trending topics, um, as you can see here, you've got uh, like associated phrases and actually this is a slightly outdated screenshot. There's been a sort of facelift to content cues and you can now even see topics that are trending currently like over the last 24 hours, which is cool too. Um, but more importantly, I think the, the feature is really useful because it surfaces the exact language that your customers use to describe their issues. You're actually getting the words that they used in the tickets they submitted. And so I think, you know, in the world of Google and all the things that we ask Siri and Alexa and stuff like that, that it's extra important to understand how your customers might describe their question or problem, especially if you want them to be able to find those answers via search of some kind or a bot of some kind, which is of course a topic that we will get around to again later. Um, and then finally, content cues also makes it really easy for you to move from seeing these trends from a sort of zoomed out view uh, to actually opening those tickets and reading the information that's contained within them. So um, once we've identified what those like largest clusters are and found content cues that help us understand how customers are describing those issues, we actually spend quite a bit of time reading through those example tickets. Um, and not only does that help us understand what is the resolution? Most of us are not experts on how to solve customer problems or troubleshoot specific things, 
but it also might help us understand any like subtopics or trends or themes that come up within those tickets as well too. So um, are there questions that our customers are always asking about triggers? Spoiler alert, yes. <laughs> Um, are there tickets that always get resolved with like one action from our team that's really repeatable that might be like a good candidate for a process improvement or an automation? Yes. And some of those trends are the things that emerge as you spend a little time digging through those tickets. Once we have an idea of where we think we can have an impact, um, we also try to look at those tickets and understand where content specifically could either be created or improved to better address those kinds of questions. So some examples of what that content ends up looking like could be um, articles that capture frequently asked questions. Um, and I'll come back to this many, many times, but you'll notice those are a lot of how do I or can I first person type of questions. Um, and those are usually like a short how to uh, question with a single answer, problem with a single solution, that kind of thing. Uh, we also create and manage short two minute or less videos that showcase how to accomplish something. Those are really popular and we always hope to make more. We also publish guided paths or sort of step-by-step -step guidance for processes that we know can cause confusion as they um, unfold or where we can kind of predict the next question that someone's gonna ask. Um, it allows us to just be a little bit more proactive <laughs> in guiding them through a problem. And those are interactive, which is really cool too. You can kind of cross things off the list as you uh, eliminate variables and you try to troubleshoot something. And then finally, we own our um, implementation of AnswerBot today. And so a lot of what we do when we evaluate content uh, involves tuning our content for use with AnswerBot. I'll come back to that in a couple of slides, but I do just want to highlight that some of our content effort is specifically dedicated to making things bot friendly or making sure that what we have out there is performing the way it ought to be with AnswerBot today. And I'll go into detail about what that looks like. So. Um, a question we usually get also is how do we think about um, content hierarchy or where do we place things to make them um, as findable as possible? So I wanted to talk a little bit about how we think about strategic publishing in the Help Center. Um, for us, each category is a Zendesk product. And then within each category, you'll find standardized sections. So getting started with a product, using that product, and then advice and troubleshooting related to that product. And you've probably hopefully seen that our community topics are structured the same way. Um, that might seem a little basic <laughs> at its uh, front, but we really think it makes it easier to understand how the information is organized. And, you know, most users just want to be guided along. So we think this really, really visual layout makes it easier for users to click exactly where they need to. And we always recommend that if you are thinking about how to structure or place your content, that you start by understanding how your users like to navigate. Um, you know, this is built for browsing, but maybe do they like to search or do they just click on links that get shared to them by your agents? And for us, we actually know that a lot of our customers like to search. Um, almost 50% of our traffic comes from Google searches. And then on our help center, our users perform about 65,000 searches per month. Uh, so we think about the search experience just as much as we think about the browsing experience. So you'll notice um, the search bar on our, our help center is on the header on every page. You can search from pretty much anywhere. <laughs> uh, we keep scope searched to the current category. So if you're looking at information about support and you perform a search, you're going to get results that are related to that product. You can easily navigate to another product if that's what you wanted to do, but we do think it makes results more relevant. And then I kind of hinted at this, but we spend a lot of time um, optimizing our content for search. Uh, we think it's really imperative that you tune your content to just match the way your audience is searching. I'll talk a little bit later about how you can look for that information, um, but that is a, a process that we are committed to continually. It's kind of a never ending task. We're always looking at content and spotting ways to make it perform better with search specifically. As I mentioned, we also publish a lot of our content specifically for use with AnswerBot. So um, in addition to tuning things for search, we also do a lot of tuning to make sure that AnswerBot can easily match a question with the right article that addresses it. Uh, the best articles for AnswerBot, if you're not familiar, are short, focused on a single topic, 
um, you know, answer about weighs the first 75 words of an article more heavily than the rest. So it's important that you get as much context as possible in those first 75 words. Uh, we also make sure that our articles use customer language. We use that first person um, tone wherever we can, like how do I or can I? Um, and as we kind of talked about, we really try to pull the exact words that our customers use to describe their issues and use those to stretch, structure our articles. Um, and I just like to call out too that <laughs> our final sort of strategic action in crafting these articles to work well with a bot um, is to accept that redundancy can be okay. <laughs> I think for some people that can sound like a scary statement, but I'll point to the example in this slide. Um, we had an article in our knowledge base that described how a user could alter their uh, account owner or designated you know, super admin, uh, gave them instructions step-by-step step on how to change it. The article is like a complete guide to that particular feature and how to use it. And it even covers some additional information like an account owner's capabilities and responsibilities. But we discovered that we were getting a lot of tickets where customers simply didn't know how to find who the current account owner is. Um, and even though the steps were contained in an existing article, our users weren't finding it because they were looking for something slightly different. They were asking a slightly different question. So we pulled that information out and recreated it um, in a new article that walks you through some of the same steps to find the information. Um, but it's a slightly different goal that the customer is trying to accomplish. And if you visit this article today, you'll see that it's short, focused on a single topic, and it even has a video for people who might want to learn that way. So now those steps might technically exist in two different places, um, but this has proven to be a very popular article and answers that specific question a lot more often without people needing to submit tickets. So it can be a change of mindset, but um, we've definitely seen success with it overall. <laughs> Hey, Maddie, can I pause you for just a second? Of there course. was a question that came in that talked about how do we add customer context or customer language into the articles themselves to help with search? Would you be able to talk to that just a little bit? Yeah, just absolutely. The of that? Yeah, I'm, I think, of course, um, what I might recommend there first is read up on the mechanics of how search actually works within Zendesk. There's an article we can share that explains how the algorithm works and what it's weighing heavier than other things. Um, in addition to the title, of course, being reflective of the question that's being asked or the problem that's being described, you can certainly put other context in the body of the article. Sometimes what we'll do is like rephrase the question a couple different ways near the top of the article. That makes it um, easy for AnswerBot to understand that that article, uh, that that question might be described a couple different ways. And then of course also works well with regular Help Center search too. Um, you can also use labels if we're talking about Help Center search to help boost certain articles. If you know there's like terminology that your customers might use in different ways. Um, but I think it really helps to understand uh, how, how search is deciding what to pull first. So I'll make sure to get that link out later. And then I would say just, just as like you might need to be okay with a little redundancy between two articles, it's also okay to restate a question within the article if it would help us another customer find the same article a different way. I don't know, Melissa, if there's anything else you would add to that too. No, that's, that's great. We get that question so often. Thanks for addressing it. I just popped a couple links in the chat uh, with links to articles on optimizing your articles for AnswerBot and best practices in helping AnswerBot find the right articles more easily. Thank you, Dave. Thanks for that, Dave. Excellent. Well, and then I also wanted to just highlight a couple different ways that we monitor our answer bot activity to spot um, opportunities for improvement over time. I didn't put it here, but I will definitely say um, we do use a lot of the default like out of the box explore metrics um, and even dashboards to report back to like our leaders and executives, you know, we report on resolutions and contextualize that within how many tickets we're getting overall as a department and company. Um, but I wanted to highlight for this audience, maybe some um, more operational queries <laughs> that you can build to help you understand ways you might drive those other metrics like resolution in a new direction. Uh, so the first suggestion that I had is uh, on the left here, using um, a, a a query to look for what's called answer inquiry. Um, that is like the exact language that your customers are using when AnswerBot responds to their 
question. So especially if you're using AnswerBot in the web widget, we have found this to be an extremely useful data point. As you can see here, this is a, an older screenshot, but we had a hello problem to solve. <laughs> you know, there were a lot of people saying, hi, hello, um, and uncovered that we needed to do something to help them understand they were talking to a bot, for example. Your, your top inquiries will look very different than ours, I'm sure, but I will include in the deck afterward too um, a recipe for both of these queries. I just kind of plopped it in there so you'll be able to see it and build it yourself. Um, and then in the second screenshot, you'll see that we also have a query where we monitor articles that we're working on. So I really like this one because we look at things we've been um, publishing or updating in the last month and then watch over time how those articles perform with AnswerBot. So looking at things like how often was it suggested, clicked through to, how often did it lead to resolution. Um, to me, this really helps validate that the updates you're making are working <laughs> um, or might present to you an opportunity where you haven't quite hit the mark yet and it's not quite meeting your customers' needs when they're interacting with AnswerBot too. And I'll share the recipe for that one afterward too. Awesome. And then, um, you know, a question we also get all the time is how do you keep content up to date? I think that's a relatively universal problem for knowledge teams. Uh, and I did want to highlight this today, even though we won't go into great detail, but the primary way we maintain content is by involving our agents in that process. So our agents talk to our customers all day. They use articles all the time, either to, you know, find an answer to a problem if they don't know it or to validate their answer as they give instructions to a customer. Um, and to do so, our agents primarily use the Knowledge Capture app. So first and foremost, they can link articles to tickets. And that, by the way, is not just like a clickable hyperlink in the ticket, but it's actually a behind the scenes data point as well too, linking a number of tickets to an article. So you can understand over time how often that article is helping an agent resolve a problem, even if they're not sharing it with the customer, or maybe it's an internal article. Um, and that of course can help us understand a little bit of like frequency and timing with which those issues occur. And then perhaps even more importantly, uh, our agents use the Knowledge Capture app to flag articles they find that need an update. So that can be because the article has become outdated, um, or maybe there's information that's unclear or a little buried, um, or maybe there's just an embarrassing typo or a translation error. Uh, we incorporate our agents into this into our knowledge management as part of KCS uh, or knowledge centered service. And as was mentioned earlier, we did go into much greater detail on how we apply KCS in other ways in another webinar. So we'll make sure everyone has the link to that if you want to learn more. Um, but finally, our agents can also even draft and publish quick articles if they uncover new information in tickets. So they really get to not only contribute um, updates and suggestions, but they also can add over time too, which is really great. Um, and then a few other suggestions we have for long-term content maintenance um, that I wanted to throw out here, perhaps for a more advanced portion of the audience, um, but something to inspire and consider for everyone. All of these suggestions rely on automation, which we think is great because that's reduced or eliminated work for you. Um, firstly, we have an automation that pulls page views of our articles from Google Analytics. Um, and if the article is low or zero in page views, or hasn't been updated in a very long time, it gets automatically archived, just moved out of sight and out of mind for our customers. Uh, and then we also have a notification when that happens that gets sent to Slack to let us know what was actioned and why, so we can keep an eye on it and unarchive things if we feel like perhaps that wasn't the right move. Um, luckily for you, if you are interested in doing something similar, there's a feature in Content Cues that does something similar. Uh, so in Content Cues, if you click the Articles to Review tab, uh, you can see content that either has a suggestion to be archived if the article is not driving page views, it's getting low or no page views, um, or you'll see a suggestion to update the article if it is driving a lot of page views and especially if it hasn't been updated in a while. So you take manual action from there. It's not an automatic process, but I think it is pretty cool that this um, data gathering and surfacing happens automatically within that feature. And then finally, we have also automated translation of all of our articles. We author and publish our content in English and then translate into six other languages, seven, I think now actually. <laughs> 
Um, and this all happens automatically. And whenever we tell our fellow knowledge folks about this, people get really excited. So I thought I would also walk through a quick diagram of how this works for anyone who might be interested. Um, so first things first, each week, we use Zendesk APIs to look for guide content that has been authored um, or updated in the last seven days. So we're just looking at our default language content and is there anything that's new or that has been edited. Um, we reference those article IDs against Google Analytics page views. So we're just trying to understand utilization at that point in time, what's being looked at and what's not being looked at. The bottom 80% of those uh, articles by page views get sent through to a uh, translation memory program first and then through an auto, uh, an automatic translation engine after that. So the bottom 80% are going through purely machine translation. A human's not really touching them. Um, but by comparison, the top 20% uh, go through a similar translation memory program and then get a human touch. So that top 20% are perhaps getting an extra little bit of attention um, because we know that people are viewing those articles more frequently. Now, once the translations are complete, whether it's machine or human translation, uh, we have another poll. It's about two minutes for machine translation, about a week for human translation, just based on our relationship with our vendors. Uh, but then we have Zendesk APIs that allow us to automatically push those translations back to our instance of guide. So this is really cool. I don't know if there are people out there in the audience who are feeling the pain of managing translations and spreadsheets today. Um, we really wanted to move away from that lifestyle for ourselves uh, and have found this to be really, really incredible. It's awesome to be hands off, but also to know that you're making data driven decisions and maybe focusing the money you spend on translation on the content that you know is proving most useful to your users. Awesome. And then finally, just wanted to share a little bit about how we know whether or not we're successful in doing what we do. Um, first, if you'll remember, we started this whole knowledge exercise by looking at tickets and reading through tickets. <laughs> so our first suggestion is to keep an eye on those tickets. You know, as we uncover trends in our customer tickets, we share those findings with other parts of the business, including engineering and our product teams. So we certainly don't ever want to take full credit <laughs> for all the changes that occur in ticket trends over time. But I would say, especially as you're starting to identify your low hanging fruit in those biggest areas of opportunity, you can definitely expect to see decreases in those biggest clusters of tickets for sure. Um, and then we also use a lot of the metrics and queries that come available to us in Explore. I don't think it always tells a complete story, but we do think that looking at things like page views of articles can really help you understand at least what are your customers interested in learning about, um, maybe what are they struggling with? And you know that because they're looking at those articles over and over again. Um, we also monitor our search terms. Like I said before, we um, maybe adapt or tune content based on what we see people searching for. And I also talked about the links that our agents can, can provide between tickets and articles. We do also monitor those over time um, within the Knowledge Capture app to just see what kinds of problems are coming up and where is that content being used or shared. And then finally, at the highest level, we would at least recommend measuring your self-service ratio. That's also known as a self-service score. Uh, it's just a simple calculation of the number of page views within a time period divided by the number of tickets that you received within the same period. I also have a link to an article that we can share afterward um, that talks about all of these different things and how you might measure them using Explore or some other Zendesk tools. I'll definitely say that on my team, we've really um, leveraged a lot of the default dashboards and just made uh, clones of them and made slight tweaks to alter our reporting needs. And I think that's kind of the easiest way to pick and choose what works for you. And that's actually all I had as far as sharing from our end. <laughs> Melissa, I see your hand raised. I have some great questions that I thought I would pitch to you. Please do. Right, right now, I think there's um, a question here from AJ about how do you approach your article linking data since agents can sometimes link the wrong article and can't edit it on the ticket? So would you just talk about linking and kind of how we think about it and our experiences with that would be. Yeah, that's cool. a great call. I think in addition to like 
linking the wrong article is totally possible. And I think sometimes people also might link articles that are like too specific or too generic to be counted as like an actual answer to the customer's question. Um, I would say a really interesting experiment that we did in the last year is that we actually did our own maybe like small pilot of QAing knowledge activities specifically with the assistance of our QA team. We built out a small rubric to just try and understand patterns. We didn't actually want to like QA individual behaviors. We just wanted to understand the trends. Um, And we actually found that we had perhaps a bit of an issue with people linking the wrong thing. (laughs) Uh, and what we actually uncovered is that we we needed to do a little more enablement for our team on searching. Like, how do you search? I don't think a lot of people knew that we write our articles using our customer's perspective. And so we did a little round of socialization, you know, um, general enablement after that and updated our new agent onboarding as well, too. Um, so if you happen to have a QA team, I, I know ours was really excited to think about building a new rubric that measured something different. Um, but I think it all comes down to, of course, like spotting those trends and then trying to adapt the behavior without punishing individuals. As we know, in KCS, it can be complicated to find that middle ground. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Excellent. There's another one, which is right in your wheelhouse too, which is advice. What advice do you, uh, would you share about getting agent buy-in for contributing to the knowledge base? This is a great one. How do you do that? I will also say that we go into a little more detail about this in the KCS webinar. So I will recommend that you watch that if you have time to do so. Um, I think you really have to find the what's in it for them. Um, And for us, I think a lot of that means recognizing their contributions, Uh, not even always just the people who contribute the most, but, you know, let's say an agent captures some knowledge that leads to 50 answer bot solves in a month. That's like 50 tickets that they and their team didn't have to to solve. And so we work really hard to try and recognize what the actual outcomes of that are, Um, as well as doing some things like best practice exports. We will interview um, agents who maybe just have strong participation, whether that's numbers or they know the right time, I guess, (laughs) to contribute. And we uh, include those interviews in our monthly newsletter. So they also get the chance to sort of be spotlighted on their peers. There's a couple other things I could share too, but I will encourage you if you have time, AJ, to watch the uh, other webinar because I think you'll see a little bit more detail too. Hey, Maddie, we did get a question from Melody in the chat and she's wondering who is responsible for providing the content and the knowledge base? Is it the product team that's responsible? Do they train the product authors to write that content? Yeah, that's a great question. I would say we have um, actually kind of a nice big ecosystem of content contributors at Zendesk. The product team does have uh, technical writers who are assigned to each product and they're they're, um, sort of deeply embedded as new features are released or updates are made. You know, if there's something that you need to do in Zendesk, they would basically write the manual on how to do it. Um, And then in addition, my team, of course, does do some of that strategic content creation. Uh, Our KCS program, our agents are creating and editing content all the time. And then there are just lots of other groups out there. I mean, Jeremy, as a product marketing manager, has published content to our help center before. Um, We have lots of communications teams at Zendesk, of course, that contribute there too. I'm probably forgetting other people as well. But community team. Did you say community team? I think of them as one of us. (laughs) (laughs) But I do feel like it's a helpful reminder that the, if you have a community team, it's likely that they're spotting trends of customer questions that could be addressed with a more targeted um, effort from a content team or, or a knowledge management team. So it's a really great opportunity for synergy. Absolutely. I've noticed a few people have been asking about our last event that was on KCS. Um, We do have a recording of that. I just shared it in the chat. So I would definitely recommend uh, taking a look at that if you are curious on some of the KCS aspects of knowledge management and how Zendus does that. Um, We do have a question from Jackie. Um, How do you advise growing from a single KCS person to a KCS team? Um, like what worked best for you in, um, and what would you have done maybe differently than what you did in the past? So I began as the single KCS person, uh, which was my responsibilities originally were to grow 
the participation of our advocates or our agents in the knowledge management program. And over time, it became apparent that we needed to have, um, in addition to the participation of our agents, we needed to have more folks generating customer specific, customer needed content that augments product documentation. It's not intended to replace it. It's intended to be in addition to that. So, and this was enabled by our uh, leadership inside our support organization. So I think it's, if it's a, if there's a need, it's helpful to generate some um, energy and passion around it with your leadership team and express what you feel you could be doing, but you can't do without more participation from other people. It's usually pitching what you really wanna do and getting people excited about that. And then more than likely you will be enabled to do that, assuming that that's part of the strategic direction of your leadership team. So I guess that would be my biggest um, best practice is to just be constantly thinking about what you feel your customers need from you, from a self-service point of view, and then determine how best to meet those needs. And oftentimes that, that might require you to be requesting additional resources on the team to do that. And so just continuing to grow it that way. Maddie, would you add anything there to that? Because it, it's, a, it's a question we get oftentimes too. I don't know if you yeah. answer it differently when you get asked that question. And other uh, you, you definitely have the basis of it. I guess the other thing I would add is that if you're feeling the need to grow a team bigger than that, I can't overstate how important it is to speak the language of the rest of your, of the business. You know, I think, um, you know, I mentioned like, for example, we want to highlight where, um, new articles or edited articles really make a difference with AnswerBot. And, you know, if I can say participation from other people leads to X number more of AnswerBot resolutions per month, tickets that we're preventing, like that's just a totally different ball game to be able to bring to a leader to ask for additional resources. Um, I guess that's probably the only thing I would add, you know, if you can find a way to especially speak the right language in numbers, I think it helps a lot. <laughs> It does, definitely does. We have a question that just disappeared. Hold on, I definitely want to get this out into the into the general chat. Um, Ashley was asking, are there any specific best practices on when agents should flag versus just simply making the additional, uh, making the addition slash edits on their own? Is it just about if they have the time or if they have enough knowledge to make the proper updates? What are your thoughts on that? Well, in a really traditional KCS environment, um, all agents would edit directly. In, in traditional KCS methodology, flagging is not necessarily um, a process that exists. However, I think where it's really, really useful to make a distinction for us uh, is that we have, and I assume most of our customers would have too, different ownership, areas of ownership within our help center and different content types. And so for example, while our agents can edit anything that has been published by a fellow agent, if it's another you know, support agent who wrote it and they have updated information, they can just edit it and publish it. But for example, our product documentation team, the folks who are literally writing the manual on how to use Zendesk, um, if there's an edit that's needed to one of those, that's where flagging becomes really important because their source of truth might be different from ours. And so we can still collect that feedback and share it while sort of like protecting the version control. I think ideally, eliminating barriers to letting people edit if you can make it easier for them to do it at any point in time that's better <laughs> for sure but I think it's important to acknowledge there are situations where the guardrails are important too and you might want to protect certain content types or certain um, teams processes a little bit more and that's where flagging is really important too yeah I'll, I'll add that I think one of the most helpful reminders about KCS is that it's a journey too and that it's often a evolution from a, a little bit more constrained environment to one that's less constrained because you get more confident over time and your agents get more confident over time. And so starting with perhaps a more gated model might not be like the official end state of where you want to go. And, but 
where you might need to start in order to um, one secure approval for the process in the first place. Like you may have some barriers to getting um, everyone access to creating and writing content. Um, but over time, you will find growing support for that behavior. It's just an inevitability, but getting started is really the more important part of that. So don't, we have a saying, don't let perfect get in the way of good, or I don't even know what Dana said. <laughs> yeah, there we go. It's better to get started, even if it's not the perfect solution that you'd love or the perfect solution as it's documented, but um, just feel confident that beginning is, is, is the helpful way to think of it and that you will get better and your organization will get better and you'll, you'll just learn as you go. So have confidence that it's the right way to go because you, you will find that it is. Excellent. Um, we did have, we do have a few more questions and I know we are running a little short on time today. We're gonna answer as many of these as possible. Um, again, keep those questions coming. Even if um, we do run out of time, we'll go ahead and get those answers addressed afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, I do wanna to get to a couple of these that just popped in. Um, so if a question isn't answered by the answer bot, is it possible to generate an email ticket instead of starting a live chat with an agent? Our team doesn't have the bandwidth to handle a large amount of chat lines. We want to, we want to utilize many of the answer bot features. Yeah, wholeheartedly understand. Um, yes, you can. Well, what you would do is instead set up a ticket form on the widget. Um, so AnswerBot, for example, can try to handle the conversation first, and then at the end of the conversation, if they didn't get their resolution, they would submit a ticket via a form, but it's asynchronous and becomes an email ticket after that. They would get any responses via email. And I feel, yeah, it's hard. You can't just open up chat to the masses. <laughs> and I'm noticing we are still getting a couple product roadmap related, related questions. Um, while we are glad we're getting those and we're gonna go ahead and try to take those to the proper channel so that way we can potentially get a response on those. Uh, those are things that we really can't address live right now, just on the basis that we don't have the product team here to kind of answer roadmap questions and whether things will be developed or not. But that being said, um, you will feel, feel free to ask those. We'll do our best to get answers for those, but those are things that right now we're, we're not gonna be able just to answer off the cuff, unfortunately. I will say I can take Janine's question in there too. Um, Janine's looking for a way to see which articles have been linked in a specific ticket. Um, it does require an extra click, but if you change from the conversation view in the ticket to the events view in the ticket, you'll actually be able to see um, linking and flagging events that happened in that ticket in the events flow. And it'll show you which article was linked as well. So that's one way to see it in the specific ticket. You'd have to click once to get to the events view, but just in case you need to see it, that hopefully that's helpful. <laughs> Thanks, Manny. Yeah. And I did see also that there was one from Melody that had made it into the main chat that I can take too. Um, which was, do we let agents publish directly to the knowledge base or do the articles still go through a review process to check for formatting or accuracy? Uh, we also will, we do go into greater detail about that in the KCS webinar, um, but to give you like a high level answer, um, some agents get additional enablement um, and review and even some additional time in their schedule. And those folks get lots of extra, they, they know all of our writing guidelines inside and out. They actually get to learn quite a bit about knowledge management. Um, but our everyday participants um, submit things for review. And then the, some of those more specialized agents who have extra training do go through a quick review process. And I will say that's actually counter to the traditional KCS methodology as well. Um, however, we have found that it works well for us because it gives us an additional data layer and a couple extra data points that we can report on to track participation and recognize it too. Great. Looks like we got another question in from Steph. Um, Steph asks, what are some of the best practices for organizing both agent-facing documentation and client-facing articles within the same instance of guide? The second most common question <laughs> that we get. Smile, because it's a fun one. <laughs> it is. I'll let Maddie take it, but it is a common question. Yeah, actually, this is a well-timed question for us because uh, 
I'm part of a task force kind of uh, myself and some of my team members that has actually been working to try and improve our internal facing documentation um, and how it fits into the sort of greater ecosystem of our help center. Um, and so I'll just share, like, we, we don't have a perfect setup. That's actually the first thing I'll say is that I don't think we've solved that problem ourselves yet. We're in the process of figuring it out. Um, but I think the first thing I'll say is that we're trying to achieve some level of standardization for search. Our agents in particular, they don't browse. They wouldn't, you know, they're going to search for what they're looking for. Um, so I think you have to apply some of the same principles of like improving findability and monitoring findability over time. Um, we've also been working to create some sort of content standardization, either through like titling or article format that isn't too different from our public facing documentation. We want it to be clear to our agents what should and shouldn't be shared, but we also want them to have a really easy time finding what they're looking for. And I think if we have too many different styles and perspectives and they know, oh, I have to search this way if I'm in the internal KB versus that way, if I'm in the public facing one, that's not a great experience for them. Um, the other thing that I'll say, it's in an early access program right now and is still in development, but there's some uh, really great work being done in uh, sort of a revamp, a revamp of the knowledge capture app for agent workspaces called uh, Knowledge in the Context Panel. We're just starting to play around with it, uh, but it allows our, it's a, it's a, an intelligent search mechanism for your agents so they can see what they're looking for faster and then also allows uh, them to quote certain portions of text um, from an article into a ticket, uh, which I guess the point I should make there is that we, we survey our agents for feedback once or twice a year too. That might be my other recommendation here um, is to give them a voice and like collect their feedback, ask them how they use your content today, try to do a little research. Um, to see how they feel about internal versus external and what their needs might be too. Um, okay, and then uh, I think this question is about auto archiving. Mm -hmm. um, I'm happy to share, I'll, I can give a little, I'll, I'll add it to the presenter notes to share out in the deck after this. To be clear, we don't use any triggers to archive content. What we're actually doing is um, querying Google Analytics page views uh, over a certain period of time. And then just based on a threshold, like if it's above or below a certain number, then we use Zendesk APIs to archive that content. So I'll do a little write up in the notes later, um, but it would use um, whatever, if you're using like a, a tool like Google Analytics to monitor those analytics and then Zendesk APIs to make it happen. And Maddie, just real quick, you were talking about um, the EAP um, regarding the, um, for that you were talking about, is that knowledge in the agent workspace EAP that's currently running right now? Correct, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Okay, we'll go ahead and share a link to that EAP as well for those who wanna go ahead and sign up for it and join it if, if they'd like as well. And we did have one more question. Um, do agents who are not guide managers but have editing slash publishing permissions still need to have a direct link to the guide version of the article in order to be able to edit it? If that's the case, is there an easy way for them to edit it without admin having to assign it to them? reading the question. So, okay. I might be misunder misunderstanding the question. I hope I'm not, but uh, if someone has edit permissions, they should be able to edit the article anytime they're looking at the article and guide. As long as they're signed in, there should be like an edit article button. They'll be able to click whether they just click on the link and go to that article or it was assigned to them. So they wouldn't have to have it assigned to them. However, if you have like a reviewer workflow set up and this agent's edit permissions only allow them to submit for review, they might still have limited options when they make changes, but they should still be able to hit the edit button anytime they're looking at the article, even if it hasn't been assigned to them. 